Uh, good morning and afternoon to uh, everyone, and thanks for joining us today's webinar. I'm Neil Halpin. I'm uh, the director of the UCLA Center for Healthier Children, Families, and Communities, and professor of pediatrics, public health, and public policy here at UCLA. Uh, my role today is to help host this webinar, which means I have the pleasure of introducing our distinguished speaker and facilitating the questions and answers for today. Uh, this is the seventh and the final webinar in the series, Measuring Health Development of Children and Youth, uh, and sponsored by the Life Course uh, Intervention Research Network and hosted uh, by UCLA's Maternal and Child Health uh, uh, funded uh, center here. Um, the specific focus today is to talk about uh, where we go next in terms of our measurement of uh, children's health and development. Um, and I'm very uh, pleased to have an opportunity uh, uh, to introduce our, our speaker today, Pippa Rowcliffe, who uh, is Deputy Director of the Human Early Learning Partnership at the University of British Columbia. Uh, through more than a decade of research on the power and importance of social and emotional well-being of British Columbia's children, Pippa has come to understand the importance of working through a, adults to change the a children's lives. Uh, she's an expert on health equity, the social determinants of health, and community systems change and evaluation. Uh, I've known Pippa for well over uh, 10 or more years, maybe more like 15 or 20 years at this point, and have had the opportunity to work with her um, uh, over these many years. And the Center, uh, the Human Early Learning Partner, Center, uh, Partner uh, Center at UBC and our center have worked closely together on um, um, bringing the EDI uh, to the United States. Uh, before we get started, I want to recap the topics that we've covered in the six webinars, um, and they've been uh, co-produced uh, with leadership from both Canada, Australia, and the U.S. Um, we began on how communities in Canada, the U.S., and Australia are building comprehensive life course monitoring systems and using these systems to engage and mobilize local stakeholders collectively improve early childhood ecosystems. Um, the two measures that we focused on, one was the EDI, the Early Development uh, Instrument, which is a teacher-completed checklist for children ages four to six years of age, and has been widely used now, in, originally in Canada, across all of Australia. We've uh, done it now in about 400,000 children in the U.S., and it's being used now in about 25 other uh, countries at present. Um, and the second was the middle years instrument, uh, the MDI, which is a self-reported questionnaire completed by children roughly ages 8 to 14. And that's an instrument that was developed at UBC at HELP um, and has been used there in um, uh, British Columbia and, uh, and now other places. We're starting to use it here in the United States. In addition to talking about measurement and measures and how they're being used, the other aspects of this webinar has been to really cover how communities in Canada and the U.S. are using data um, and data linkages to help create more robust life course focused data systems. Um, as well as groundbreaking approaches to using measurement directly in communities to advance health and well-being. And Pippa is going to pick up on all of what we've talked about thus far and help us sort of integrate it, think about where this takes us into the future. Um, Pippa will speak for about um, uh, uh, 45 to 50 minutes. And at the end of the presentation, we'll have questions and answers. Uh, we hope that you will ask questions and share your thoughts. There's two ways of doing that, but the probably the easiest, or one is the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. The other is the chat function. And we'll sort of go through those at the end of the uh, presentation. Uh, 
Um, so without further ado, let me turn it over to our speaker, Pippa Roquay. Okay, I'm just unmuting myself and I'm just gonna share my screen. There we go. Um, there we go. Okay, can everyone see that? You're all good to go there? Okay. Yeah, I'm, I can see it. Great. Okay, well, um, thanks, Neil. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here. It's wonderful to be doing this in partnership with UCLA that we have a long-standing um, relationship with, but um, also with all of you. I find it quite otherworldly to think that there's probably about 30 or 40 of you sitting there listening and what, listening to me and watching. So I'll try and channel you as I sit here and look at my screen. So great to be here. And um, as Neil said, what I'm going to try and do is weave a little bit of story together that connects all of the dots that you've heard about so far and then just deepens the thinking that we've been doing about how do you take all of this and really translate it into informed action. Um, so the first thing I want to do um, is acknowledge that help is located. We conduct our work on the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. Um, for us increasingly, that's not, um, we, don't, we don't make this statement lightly. This is something that we take really seriously when we consider how our um, Aboriginal children are doing in Canada, the history of colonialism, and the current um, diversity and health outcomes for um, our Aboriginal children. Um, we take this, this statement really seriously. It's about one thing that's very important to help, which is social justice and health equity. So we're very grateful to them to live and work in such a beautiful place. Just to also um, remind people that I'm talking to you from British Columbia in Canada. So I'm based at um, the University of British Columbia, Vancouver, which is down on the far west coast, working at an institute called the Human Early Learning Partnership. And the mission of our institution based at the School in Population and Public Health at UBC, University of British Columbia, is to do two really important things. The first is um, a broad-based interdisciplinary research um, program. And I'll say just a very few words about that because it's an important part of our story when I think about informing policy. And the second thing that we um, probably spend 50% of our time doing is thinking about how do we take all of this and make it real for people on the ground who are either running programs or developing policy. So when I, I mentioned I would talk about the Human Development Program of Research, one of the biggest issues for us that we think about a lot every time um, we, when we wake up in the morning is what are the differences that make a difference? And to answer that question, I'm going to share with you a lot of how we think about the monitoring data we collect, but we also have a range of different research um, themes that run within HELP that try to also lean into that question. So questions around, you know, to what degree do we see biological embedding and how much does that explain differences in children's outcomes? Um, thinking about systems increasingly is something that we spend some time, a lot of time thinking about. Socioeconomic status is also another thing that um, is fairly central to this whole idea for us of what are the differences that make a difference. And actually, um, just to double click on this a second, I came out of a meeting with our Minister of Childcare about an hour ago. And one of the things that we were talking about was why do we see such, such substantial differences in child outcomes across this province? And what are the differences that for them at a policy level make a difference? So the power of answering this question um, is a really important one to think about. So, um, Neil referred to the sessions that you've already had and broadly speaking, they fitted within the, what we call our child development monitoring system, which grew out of a report that was authored by Dr. Clyde Hertzman and others um, about 10, 15 years ago now called the world's best system of child development statistics. And out of that grew a real commitment to a monitoring system 
that really is built on the mantra, if, if you don't have data, you really can't name the problem or see the problem. The traje children's trajectories are hidden, and therefore you really have no solid foundation to act. So Clyde, um, Clyde Hertzman, our then director, um, really guided us around the creation of this, this living system or living lab, if you like, following children from some very, through very critical transitions in their lives. And you have heard about the EDI and the MDI, the early development instrument and the middle years development instrument. I'm gonna also make reference just a little bit to two other questionnaires that we're working with. And I should say, one of the important things about this is the, um, the, the system itself is a coherent system. So all of these questionnaires are designed to speak to each other. So in other words, um, gather the same kinds of information, but at slightly different developmental stages at, in life. Um, and also to allow us to build a database of children using in, with individual identifiers so that we're able actually to link these children all the way through from 18 months to school graduation and increasingly linkage into administrative data sets that allow us to look at children from birth all the way through into their adult lives. So this is a, um, a bit more of a pictorial a representation of what we're trying to do. We're trying to understand children in, their, in the locations in which they live and grow. Um, we're trying to understand these different developmental stages and key transition points and how children are doing at each of them. Um, Clyde, uh, Sorry, Neil mentioned that the, our, our focus and our foundation for the last 18 years has been the early development instrument. So this is a teacher report measure. We now have seven waves of data and I'll be showing you some of those data a little bit later in my presentation because they're really key in terms of seeking policy influence and program influence. So this has been a substantive tool across our province for 18 years and is really our foundation. One of the questions that we get asked about a lot when we spend time either with government or out in community is, how do we change the kinds of outcomes we see measured on the early development instrument? This is a really important question and it's one that the EDI data themselves don't provide a an immediate response to. We can speak generally about um, changes in vulnerability on each of the scales of the EDI, but in terms of understanding the five years of children's experience that led up to an EDI questionnaire completed, we really don't in this province have very much data to help us. Um, and I think this is actually something that's echoed across most areas of the world in which I've worked. So one of the things that we've been working on really hard, primarily because it's so critical to our knowledge translation, are two questionnaire surveys that really reflect on children's experiences before we complete an EDI for them. The Childhood Experiences Questionnaire, which I will give you a little bit more detail on, is the one we have the most um, depth with at the moment, working in 15 districts to gather population level data from parents as they bring their children into kindergarten that allow us to understand what children's experiences have been what have there been have been there the gen what are, and what the quality of those experiences have been because those things are malleable we can actually do something about those experiences when we think about program and policy work the other questionnaire that is in development is the toddler development instrument this is a, a, to, a questionnaire that we're working on both here in british columbia and also in australia at the moment and again, it's, um, an, an, it's an attempt to try and understand children's experience rather than a developmental assessment of them. Um, and again, I'm not too sure in the States, but in British Columbia, certainly there are no existing data or questionnaire surveys that allow us to understand consistently across a population how toddlers are doing and what their experiences are. So just a little bit more information on this because it's so critical to some of our knowledge translation for EDI. When we look at the Childhood Experiences Questionnaire, what we want to know, which um, in the area of health and well-being, is what is their general health like? Have they had contact with healthcare specialists, nutrition, sleep? 
motor skills and experiences, these are all things that when we share these data with others in the community, we can actually begin to start to plan around and start to intervene on language and cognition, early experiences in literacy and numeracy, attending libraries, doing things at home with their family that would be considered early learning experiences. Social and emotional is an absolutely critical one for us now um, at the moment, and I will be sharing a little bit more about how we're leaning into the issue of mental health in the province based on the kinds of data that we have. And then we also gather a wide variety of information about the kinds of places that children are spending their time in, both in childcare and out of childcare, preschool, and other licensed settings. And then finally, another area um, of critical importance to us is, is the community or neighborhood, the degree to which children are growing up in neighborhoods that are self safe, welcoming, and where there are spaces to play. So just to double click also on the MDI, which Neil mentioned had been part of your um, teleconference or webinar series so far. This is a part of our monitoring system and is really um, an intentional um, attempt to gather information from children. So we will have now a parent measure, a teacher measure and a child measure with a strong focus on social emotional development. The intention of this questionnaire is to actually try to ensure that we really have an understanding of the whole child as they move through school. Um, as a society, we're very good at measuring academic scores. We're not so good at actually understanding children's self-reported social emotional well-being. And yet we know from all of the research that social emotional well-being through the school years is probably more predictive of children, children's well-being through the school years than their academic scores at certain stages through their through their school school life. So, um, and then the YDI I won't mention too much. That's very much um, still in development. But but essentially, just to speak to each of the speak to each of the tools as part of a monitoring system. The system is intended to hang together and provide us key and critical information that is evidence based that reflects the most recent science on what we understand underpins children's development as they move through as they move through their their school years their infant years into school and then graduate and into um, secondary education so to summarize um, a brief summary on the data themselves because i think it's a really important to recognize and just honor some key aspects of the data that we gather First of all, it's longitudinal. It's, it isn't a single point in time. It attempts to understand children as they develop across their school years and is really intended to reflect the best science we can about what we know are key transitional developmental needs that children have. And then because it's linkable, we're able then to link it to administrative data sets that increases the amplification of what we have and allows us to look in far more depth at what we know, we want, um, what we know is important and also help to inform policy. So all of our data are linkable to health data sets, education data sets, and a variety of others. So linkable at the individual level. One of the most important things for good policy and program influence is that the data are val valid and reliable. Um, we spend a lot of time ensuring that we have um, built a data set that reflects what's really going on for children and also reflects developmental science and what we need to be paying attention to. Every single one of our questionnaires is developed in partnership both with government but also with our community-based partners, unions and a variety of other institutions because we know that the data we collect need to have direct and important relevance to the work that people are doing at many levels. So often we'll ask questions that may not be directly related to the kinds of research that um, are considered critical, but they're very directly relevant to policy program and practice. And the fifth thing that's really, really important about this monitoring system is that we ensure that it's a common shared platform. And what, what I mean by that is that we, um, we are now in a position where our data are used by every school district across this province, every local health authority, every health authority, a variety of different health education and other jurisdictions use our data to be able to build their own accountability 
and monitoring systems. And what, ha what happens when, when you can move to that level is it makes those cross-sectoral um, cross conversations so much more relevant, important, because you're all using the same data. And I'll talk a little bit more about that as I go forward. Um, Neil, I'm just wondering whether there's anything, uh, uh, I'm going to transition into some of the core foundations of um, some knowledge to action. I'm just wondering if there's anything popping up for people that I need to answer now before we move on. You know what, I'm not looking, but I will. Um, let me just see. Um, nothing seems to be um, right now. Um, okay. So great. I I'll check in going. with you again. Sure. I'll check in with you again okay. as I go. Yeah. Okay. So the question that Neil asked me to reflect on with you is, you know, what are what are some foundational concepts for how we move um, to a, an impactful approach uh, for what we would call knowledge to action? So taking the data that we have, all the research that underpins it, and really starting to have more intentional policy conversations. And the first thing I'm going to do is reflect on a few foundational concepts. And the reason I want to do this is that these are critical to building the kind of data set that we have, but also to building the relationships that we need to have with people who are making program and policy decisions, um, because it really underpins everything that we would want them to do with the data. So the first really important concept that underpins the work that I do around policy and program influence is the idea of connecting our data to a larger vision. HELP's vision is all children thriving in healthy societies. And for me, this isn't a vision that is simply ours. It's actually a vision that connects us across all sectors, across every organization or group that is intending to improve the outcomes for children in this province. It's a really important thing to hold on to because when we think about our mission, it's a very specific one. But I can move into any conversation with government or any org other organization around here's what we help bring to the table. And we want to work with you and through you towards this idea of a common vision. The other thing I will double click on here, a couple of things that I'd like to double click on here are, the first is that for me, this, is, this grounds us in an agenda of social equity, of social justice, that we are actually leaning into issues that are around, if we really want all children to thrive in healthy society, we have some complex and difficult conversations to have about how we address issues of equity, how we address the issues of the inequity across our provinces and in our communities um, under a common banner of social justice. The second concept is be grounded conceptually. And one of the most important concepts that grounds us in everything that we do is this idea of a bioecological approach. Um, so the notion here is one that was first developed by Yuri Brom from Brenner. It's called a bioecological model of child development. We've, um, we've massaged it and developed it a, a number of times to actually sit well for the work that we do. But it's the idea that children are nested in families. Um, they experience schools and other kinds of care settings. They're within a culture. They have peer relationships. All of those would be considered key influences and all of those impact on children's outcomes. All of those, those close or proximal influences are nested in the quality of the neighborhoods, the communities, the, the sort of the closer ecosystem, you if you like, that children live in and grow up in. And that's nested in and of itself in a much larger um, ecosystem of, in your case, state policy, in our case, provincial policy and federal policy, policies that either do or do not at different times support children and families in different ways. So larger investments like childcare or social benefit would be within that larger constellation of influences. Um, another concept that has been really critical to what we do is the idea of the long reach of early experience. 
So we know that the kinds of things that we pick up on in um, EDI data, the vulnerability data that we have for EDI, are strongly correlated with a range of other later outcomes, through from school failure to later um, health outcomes later in life. And so it's really critical for us to reflect on this. Um, I don't know of any studies more recently that have actually costed this out in a, in a detailed kind of way. But what we do know is that um, there's been a, a lot of work done, um, a lot of it in the States, around the value of investing early to avoid the kinds of long-term um, outcomes that we see related to poor early experience. The fourth concept and one that is increasingly important to us is the idea of, um, sorry, moving from a discussion of ill-being to well-being. So the EDI um, is measured and reported out. Sorry, I'm going to just stick. I'm going to go back. Sorry, I've got some kind of animation going there. Um, the EDI measures vulnerability, but one of the things that is absolutely critical to us increasingly is the knowledge and experience that negative reporting and vulnerability um, has not necessarily gained the kinds of attention that we would like to see. Um, we often see people getting shut down when we continue to report rates of vulnerability that are higher than they need to be because there's a sense of helplessness. So one of the things that we've spent quite a bit of time on recently is really thinking through strengths-based measures and strengths-based ways of reporting out data and research because it's proven to be a far more positive and um, tactile way for people to start to think of building both policy and strategy. Um, just reflecting briefly on um, another, another wave of um, negative reporting that we've seen here in this province, and I'm sure that it's been something in the States that's been um, around as well, the, the idea of adverse childhood experiences. Um, absolutely critical to understand that adversity in the early years is a powerful indicator of children's development and certainly the EDI could be considered a measure of those adverse experiences. But what it doesn't tell us is what about the 50% of children who do show up as having ACEs, sometimes more than four, who actually have very good outcomes. And so um, the, a lot of, uh, a lot of, um, effort has been placed into understanding adversity. Increasingly, we're trying to shine a light on this idea of resilience and well-being because we believe that it's the other part of the equation that is actually um, probably more important for those who are forming policy and program to build from. Concept number five, um, one that I spend a lot of time on in my, in my work here in the, in the province is really trying to counteract the use of data and evidence as a hammer, as a critique, as a way of putting people down or ranking schools or in any way trying to motivate through judgment. Um, the idea that data and research are a, a critical fulcrum for curiosity and inquiry is what's important to us. And it, this is a line that I would say that from a program and policy perspective is an increasingly critical one to hold on to. Um, and, and I believe that there are um, some really wonderful models out there of places and I, can, I will actually be sharing some of these later in my presentation, some places that really have lent into their data and research and used it as a way to motivate and to build common, common energy and um, commitment towards, towards improving children's outcomes. Concept number six, and I think this is critical as well, is the idea that um, our data system gathers children, um, information about children, whether it's the EDI, um, a teacher report, the childhood experiences questionnaire, or the TDI, where we're gathering data from parents, or the MDI, where we're gathering data from children themselves. We, we gather those data and report them by postal code, so children in neighborhood. And what's so important about that is that when we give reports to neighborhoods or institutions or um, other organizations, we're reporting 
to them about their children. It's not a cohort of children. It's not an academic group of children that they don't know. What we're giving them is information about the children that they see and touch every day. And because we gather the information at an individual level, we can report out at multiple jurisdictions. So I'm able to report out to our health ministry using their jurisdictional boundaries. I can report out to our school system using their jurisdictional boundaries and so on and so on. And all the way down to neighborhood level, which is important to us because we believe that it's where children live and the, uh, the proximal influences that have the most profound influence on their development. Um, so it's critical that we're reporting to groups about their children. And I should say that our public reporting is only ever done using children reported by their postal code or in their neighborhood or in their region. All of our school level reporting is private to avoid any kind of ranking or misuse of the data. The, the seventh concept is what we call proportionate universality. So the idea that we need to really avoid using data to get too simplistic um, and too focused on conversations about targeting. So what you see in front of you is a map of Vancouver with its neighborhoods. Each of those different colored areas is one of our neighborhoods. Um, and the dark brown neighborhoods are those neighborhoods with low socioeconomic status and dark green, those with higher um, socioeconomic status. And each of the little bubble people is five vulnerable children. So what we can see is vulnerable children may be more densely allocated to some parts of the city of Vancouver, but we do see vulnerable children across our city and they're not necessarily evenly um, evenly allocated based on socioeconomic status. But if we were to think about simply targeting to three or four of the most um, low SES neighborhoods, we would gather, um, we, would, we would be addressing the needs of a fair proportion of our vulnerable children, particularly those with the highest density. But what you can see here is that the children who are vulnerable in many of the other neighborhoods wouldn't be served at all by targeting. So one of the things that we um, we hold as a very important concept for the work that we do, the knowledge translation work that we do, is this idea that we need to build universal systems that support all children, while also acknowledging the importance of what I'll call sort of dosage or the importance of additional um, services, programs that meet the needs very specifically of children in very highly dense, um, vulnerable areas. Um, concept number eight is continuing to reinforce the power and importance of population level data. Um, this is one that I never cease to have to do when we go out and actually try to share these data because, my, because the most important thing about population level data is that they can inform policy and program in a way that individual assessment can't. So the idea here is that we do, if we do individual assessment, it allows us to understand an individual child, to produce an assessment report that can be used by individual practitioners towards a personal treatment plan, and then on to reassessing them for their program, progress and continuing to understand how they're doing. Our focus is on population level monitoring. So gathering individual level data, but reporting it out for groups of children, whether that's at the neighborhood level or the, the classroom level or the school level and up. So we gather information on a number of children. We report out in multiple ways to users who can actually then influence those larger environments in which children are spending their time um, through their policy program and investment. Oh, sorry, wrong way. And then we can also use the data to generate strategies, policies, programs, and funding to support all children, knowing that any child who needs additional help will then have the kinds of constellation and the constellation of services that they require. So um, those concepts are absolutely critical when we think about knowledge, the knowledge translation or knowledge to action work that we do at HELP. I'm gonna shift gears a little bit now and talk about sort of more the technical side or the where the rubber hits the road in terms of how we actually 
mobilize the data and research that we have toward action. So I'm going to speak about um, these five concepts and ideas briefly, and then what I'm going to do is run you through um, two or three case studies or examples of how we have used um, these principles or these practices to help us build a robust knowledge translation strategy. So the first is relationship, relationship, relationship. Um, to me, really good knowledge to action work starts with a face-to-face -face or a, a, a person-to-person -person conversation. And that has to be maintained consistently across time. What we do know is that um, in most cases, data and research are not the bread and butter of most people. It's not necessarily how they normally think. It's not necessarily how they normally build their strategies. And so for us, the process of what we would call meaning making or sitting down with people and connecting with them directly in conversation and through a variety of different workshops is an absolutely critical part of what we do. The importance of making it simple and making it a visual um, and also appealing to people's hearts as well as their minds. So the idea of using a variety of te different techniques that are not only paper-based, but, also, but also include storytelling and a variety of other ways of thinking about knowledge and understanding. Particularly important for us when we work with our indigenous population, where other forms of knowledge and other knowledges are a particularly important way of them making sense of their world. So the third principle is emergent learning and adaptation. So the idea that actually, um, as we move into community and bring data and research to, the, to them, we are learning more, much more about what they need, what their local knowledge is, and so we can adapt and change how we both report data, but also how we actually begin to look at those data to make meaning of them for them. A commitment to working at many levels and creating a common language, which I'll talk about a little bit more. And then finally, knowledge and um, excellence in knowledge, knowledge translation techniques. And you'll see some of that as I begin to go through the slides, um, the story slides that I have to share with you. So we're engaging across institutions and across systems and across communities and even engaging children. To us, one of the most, most important principles underneath this is that as an institution with our data and research, we cannot know the whole system. And the only way of shifting a system that supports children's development and supports families in raising children is to understand that system from the perspective of many. So the idea that we do um, spend, invest significant amounts of time in meaning making and also learning from the people that we share our data with. Making it simple and making it visual, there's a wide variety of different ways of thinking about this. Um, this is just one resource that I thought I would share with you. It's the datavizproject.com. It's an incredible um, website full of um, wonderful resources around how do you take very complex data and use a wide variety of different techniques for making it visual or what we would call data viz. Um, so that, you, so that people can actually, it becomes digestible for people. There's not too much information um, on one piece of paper. You've actually highlighted and really double clicked on an issue for people to wrap their heads around. So this idea of data viz, you'll see as I go through our examples, is one that we have, we have a whole team of people actually who spend their, their time doing data visualization and graphic layout for the kinds of reports that we do. Intervening at many levels. So the idea here for me is that if we really want to shift the kinds of outcomes that we see for children, it means intervening at a wide variety of different levels um, in children's earliest years, those five years before they start school, and then also across the school, the, the, the life of a child through school. And one of the traditional ways that we're pretty good at, I think, at actually thinking about intervening with children and families is through programs and services. Um, but we also need to be thinking about inter in, um, working at, at many other different levels. So the idea of influencing policy, which I'll talk a lot more about, um, the idea of influencing policy is critical. The idea also of thinking intentionally about networks collaboration and community systems that support children and families. We know that um, 
the silos that we've developed through government for investment and um, program delivery often don't serve children and families that well because systems are quite fragmented. So leaning into this idea also of community systems, networks and collaborative infrastructure in community that supports children and families. Um, and the lead, an understanding where at any point in time, data and research can be used as a lever for action on any one of these three. Building a common language is absolutely critical. Um, I have put, my, put the website um, on my final slide, so when we share slides, you'll have access to that. But help us traditionally produced a wide range of materials that support people in understanding our data. So data reports are one thing, but the other thing, the, the other kinds of things that we've lent into are research briefs that help people understand the science underneath why they would care about the kinds of outcomes that we're seeing. Um, on the EDI for sure. Um, what is the developmental science underneath that? Um, what, do parent, what do parents need to know? What do service deliverers need to know? Um, so research briefs, plain language briefs that people can use to understand the science, which is critical to then developing policy and program solutions. Um, right here on your screen, you can see Discover MDI on the top right hand side, which is, um, a a toolkit if you like an online toolkit full of information not only about mdi but also about why we would care about social emotional well-being what resources do you need to build a strategy around social emotional well-being um, and how can you involve children in in that in that journey so building a common language requires a multiple approaches not simply data reporting it also takes a lot of time and a, and a real consistency around messaging. Just another slide that takes you. It shows a, just a little um, section of our website for, in this case, MDI, where um, communities can access their MDI reports. They also get a lot of information about well being and what we mean by well being. And then finally, a link to the uh, Discover MDI website. So, really, scaffolding and supporting as much understanding as possible underneath the kinds of data and reports that we produce. So um, critical also is a very um, tight knowledge translation process. And I'm just going to walk you quickly through the process that we use at HELP. So the idea of high quality data research and evidence is critical. That's our starting point. If we don't have that, we don't have much because we don't have the kinds of, we think, grounding evidence um, and valid, reliable evidence that we need to build program and policy solutions. The second, the, the third, well, we then move through a process of planning. Our second step is planning, understanding our audience. Who are we communicating to? About what? For what purpose? What do we want them to do with the data? So this is a lot about understanding context and audience. A lot about synthesis and visualization. If we know what our audience wants, what, how are we going to take the data that we have, scaffold it, choose which data to highlight, and then be able to put it into a form that is digestible and usable. And then finally, dissemination. How are we going to do that through the web, through printed publications, through webinars, a wide variety of different techniques. And one of the most important things here for me is this process is, an, is not a static process. It's continually iterating and changing through a process of mobilization and engagement. And, it, and, and we as an institution work with our communities to continuously learn and adapt. Um, I want to actually just point at this stage to one resource that I have found really helpful before I transition on to some of the stories that uh, I've got two or three stories I wanted to tell you about um, how we have used data towards action. So there's a wonderful book called Made to Stick by Chip Heath and Dan Heath, um, which has been very helpful for us around sort of the, the stickiness of ideas and the street cred of what we do. There's a whole science and academic science around knowledge translation, but in this space of public health, 
um, and communicating to a wide variety of different audiences, all for different purposes at the same time. This, this, the stickiness of, of some of the ideas in this book are really helpful. So the book actually talks about the importance of simplicity in how we communicate. Um, finding very simple ways to communicate important uh, um, ideas in ways that are simple yet profound. Unexpectedness, being able to highlight sometimes things that don't, people don't expect to see, opening up gaps in knowledge and filling the gaps. Third, concreteness. So the idea of um, making sure that when we speak about the things we're speaking about, they're very concrete. So vulnerability is a little bit amorphous at times, but if we can embed that in the idea of what do these vulnerable, what's the lived experience of these vulnerable children, it makes a lot more sense to, to people. So a lot of this is around both making, making that, that connection between both data that we have, population level data, and lived experiences of children. Credibility, so the validity and um, reliability of our data is absolutely essential. We have to be able to speak from a place of validity. Um, emotions, so again, going back to story, um, trying to connect data to something very real for people. Um, we know that the data that we have are telling real life stories about children who both have had experiences that may be positive or negative, um, that the MDI is telling us something real about how children are feeling. And we we'll need, we need not only to be able to show those data at a population level, but have people feel what that is actually like. And then finally stories, the importance of telling stories uh, and putting those next to data. So I recommend that book to you. Um, Neil, I'm going to just take a quick um, time check. I actually can't see a clock, so I'm going to take a quick time check and see if there are any questions, and then I'll give you a couple of examples. Yeah, um, I think we're okay. you got another uh, 10 or so minutes, 10, 15 minutes. There's one question that's come in. Uh, that came in from our colleague Mitch Boyer in the UK, so we're have global reach today. And Mitch asked, how far have you gotten with the development of PDI in check in terms of when they're ready for prime time to be used? So, um, Well, I'll head that one off quickly. Um, TDI is still very much at um, a piloting stage, um, but it is being piloted in Australia. So there might be some interest in the possibility of a pilot in the UK. Czech, um, I would say, has moved out of pilot into scale. Um, we're now funded by our Ministry of Education to scale that across the province. Um, we have population right. level data in three school districts now, and we're working in 15. And in actual fact, Mitch, um, I just got back from England where I was working with some folks in Nottingham, um, and one researcher in Newcastle who um, I've put directly in touch with our Czech researchers because there's interest up there in the potential of doing um, a pilot or doing some focus groups and bit of a, a bit of an adaptation to see how it would work there. So I'd be really happy if you touch base with me and I can put you in touch with the right people if you have an interest. Yeah, and uh, just to follow up on that, uh, Pippa, I know that Mitch and uh, the folks in Nottingham and uh, Newcastle and Bradford and others were all going to be meeting sometime in early January. One of the focus areas is going to be on data. These are all places that are sort of interested in this all children thrive kind of approach that we've been talking about. And we're, we're trying to move forward with a check here in, in the U.S. also, uh, and principally because with the EDI for uh, teachers, uh, the, I think there's two things that I'll just say. One is the EDI, you don't do the EDI until the child has been in the classroom for three months. And so it's not something that's done right when the child walks in the door. And the check can be done earlier in the child's experience when they come to, to the school and gives the teacher some information right off the bat to get, actually begin to get to know the child. So there's some interest in, in using it because of that um, benefit as well. So, um, but that's the only question we've had so far. And so I would suggest. Okay, I'll cycle through on. a few. Yeah, I'll cycle through a few examples and then we can talk about, but Mitch, don't hesitate to be in touch if you want to follow up on that. 
Um, okay. Um, I just want to give you a few examples of how everything I've said plays out in practice. So it's all been a bit theoretical up until now. Um, but I want to just um, speak a little bit about what this actually looks like for us. So um, I'm going to talk at two levels. First of all, influencing regional or local policy, and then I'll talk about sort of state level or provincial policy. Um, so one of the things that we've focused on for a while has been um, five key ideas that sit underneath uh, what we believe makes a difference from an EDI perspective or an early development um, perspective. The idea of intersectoral leadership, a focus on evidence, data and research, alignment between health, school, early care and learning sectors, a plan to improve access and decrease barriers, especially for those hard to reach families, and finally, a commitment to advocacy. So this has been um, actually a bit of a mantra that goes all the way back to Clyde, um, that when Clyde Hertzman, our founder, was alive, he really um, was beginning to speak more intentionally about these, these areas of work. And these are things that we pay a lot of attention to. So in, in British Columbia, alongside the emergence of the earlier development instrument that's been around now for 18 years with seven waves of data, what also grew up were um, intersectoral early years collaboratives across the province that involved a wide variety of different sectors depending on where you were in the province, so 155 of them. And since about 2004, we can point to well over a thousand initiatives and interventions that are directly related or connected to EDI data or have drawn directly from them. Um, these are tables that, because they grew up with us, have really been um, part of Help's Bread and Butter. I do more presentations to these collaborative infra this collaborative infrastructure than almost anywhere else. The kinds of organizations involved in these kinds of collaboratives have been children in some places, community planners, parents, educators, sports, recreation, health. And what this, what this really highlights is that if we're talking about the early years, no one institutional infrastructure can really do the work of making change. We really need to have this collective approach to supporting, supporting thinking, supporting work, supporting investment. Um, and some of the things that have emerged out of the, this kind of work has been um, district-wide planning and setting long-term well-being goals. So here's an example from one of our um, school districts um, in the creation of the, their most recent strategic plan. And in this case, they're using MDI data as a key driver for their plan and their collaborative work. So um, the goal being creating a positive culture in their schools. Um, they're going to do that by increasing their sense of belonging as measured on the MDI by 2%. Um, and then also, um, changing some of the other measures on the MDI that reflect relationships, so children's connectedness to adults. So direct use of our data in not only measuring outcome, but also creating the goal in the first place. Um, one of the most important things the MDI encourages us to lean into is the idea that academics in school are, uh, are not the only thing we should be paying attention. We really need to build positive learning cultures. Um, another example of a, a region here in British Columbia, Richmond is a district that sits just south of Vancouver. It's actually where our international airport is. And they used a lot of the data they had available to them on all of their intersectoral work drawing from it to build a children's charter of rights that was taken into City Hall and which can, continues to guide citywide policy for children and families. This is a map of um, the interior of British Columbia. Um, it's one of our traditional maps where we map EDI data or vulnerability rates, vulnerable on one or more scales of the EDI. And we map the whole province for every wave of data all the way down to the neighborhood. And what I, what, the reason I showed this map in particular is you can see some very dense areas of vulnerability. Dark red is dense vulnerability and lighter areas of the map are very low vulnerability. 
Um, so you can see here on the sort of middle to right hand side of the screen, a place called Revelstoke with very low or light shaded vulnerability rates. Revelstoke is a really interesting story for us to lean into because they had quite um, high vulnerability back in 2004 when we first started gathering data. Um, through an intentional focus on data and research and very strong leadership from both the city and the school district and major institutions, and also a very dense network of collaborative partnerships, they have brought their vulnerability rate down and kept it down below 15% for the last 12 years. And I think it's a really important story, not about program, um, or about services, but actually how a more effective collaborative approach to where every child and family is placed at the center and any new family is welcomed um, into the neighborhood by a single, a single service delivery agency, but is then becomes, becomes held by that neighborhood. Um, so there are some very important stories where neighborhoods have really come together through their intersectoral work. I want to jump to a slightly different story, and that's of um, a school district that is just to the east of Vancouver, Burnaby. This is a map of their MDI data from 2014-15. And you can see here, this is a map of their thriving as based on MDI data. They have some areas of high thriving. So that means um, the, the darker the color, the higher the level of thriving. Um, the lighter the color, the lower the level of thriving. And you can see some real difference across this school district in terms of how children are doing. The intersectoral group and school district in Burnaby um, looked at this and also looked at um, what we also measure on the MDI, which is their assets index. So these are things that children are reporting as either having in their lives to support their well-being or not. Um, oh, I, Sorry, I forgot, to, I forgot the slide was in here. What's important is we can directly, using MDI data, connect the number of assets we're measuring children telling us in their lives and their self-reported well-being. So there's a very strong correlation between the number of assets and well-being. So children's well-being was very varied, and we also knew from the maps that um, this is a map particularly of MDI assets with relation to after school activity for grade four children. And you can see here that dark, dark is more assets, light is fewer assets. What Burnaby highlighted was that they had um, a real um, difference in the way children were being served across their region. And so they spent um, a lot of time planning together, a lot of time focused on intersectoral work again, around addressing this issue of um, after school activity access for all children. And what I'm gonna cycle through is a set of maps. So this is 2012, 2013, 2014, 2015, 15, 16 and 1718, and what you can see from those maps, I'll cycle through again, is they went from a place of real um, disparity, if you like, or inequality of service access, all the way through to essentially a single color in terms of accessibility for all children. So again, an example of a school district and a collaborative piece of work across a, a school district that really actually shifted them in the right direction over time, keeping an eye on the prize, which was, and using the data as a way of guiding them. So when we think about provincial policy and having just walked out of a meeting with our Minister for Childcare, I just want to reflect a little bit on this and then I will close. Um, EDI data in particular are a critical weather vane, I'll call it, for provincial policy. For me, I can now walk into a, a meeting with a Minister of State and be able to show them that no, um, in spite of all of the investment and intention that has been placed on children and families over a period of time, our vulnerability rates have gone up over time. They have not gone down. We can see very particular um, shifts in vulnerability rates around social competence. So this is social competence across um, six waves of data, our um, vulnerability is going up from 13.3 to 16.1 in wave seven, and an even more dramatic shift in emotional maturity by wave 
from when we started reporting on our data from wave two to wave seven. And for me, this is a really powerful tool in being able to work directly with politicians to talk about a range of different issues that relate to children's development and families' well being here in the province of British Columbia. I've shown you a map already, but the map is also one that in particular helps us highlight that we have a wide disparity of outcomes for children. And one of the most important questions we spend time with policymakers on is what is going on well in those places that have lower vulnerability and what's going on in those places that have much, much higher vulnerability and how can we try to address the needs of those highly vulnerable areas? We can actually look at the difference, the spread in vulnerability rate between, district, in, between districts and neighborhoods. And um, coming back to that theme of social justice, um, we would argue that it is a matter of social justice when we see a spread in neighborhood vulnerability from 9% to 60%. Um, what I can say is that over the 18 years that we've been working with EDI data, it's also true that governments come and go. And um, up until about two or three years ago, we were working with a government that really was not, um, was not as well embedded in some of the social policies that we would recommend from an evidence base when necessary for children and families. So a lot of the vulnerability rate we believe was due to an underinvestment in children and families. What we now have is a, a, um, a slightly, well, a government that has actually really made a commitment to ten, um, over 10 years, a universal childcare um, policy and has also begun to lean in particularly to childcare um, and also early learning as a framework for our movement forward. So we're hopeful that we will be able to start to report to governments and fairly substantive shifts in vulnerability rates over the next while. I also highlighted for you those social and emotional trends and it, those have been really critical um, foundations for us to become more involved in trying to build a better dialogue across this province about social and emotional development. Um, we produced a report um, in 2016 for the government about the power and importance of social emotional development for infants. It's one that has been picked up more recently by our new Ministry of Mental Health and Addictions, where they're really talking about prevention and promotion and thinking very seriously about how do we actually address the mental health issues or social emotional well-being of infants and therefore families. So a very important topic that's allowed us to get a little bit of a window into providing evidence around this, this area of work. Um, we also talk a lot about social emotional fitness and children's voices in the school system and through the work of Kim, Kim Schoen at Reichel, our director, who you've heard from on one of the other webinars um, and a variety of other educational leaders over time, we saw a, a renewed curriculum here in this province. Um, where um, I just highlight at the bottom of the screen, for the first time ever, we saw personal and social competency built directly into our education system. And I'll, I'll connect that directly to the research um, and the data that we've been gathering about personal, uh, social emotional well being at the MDI, but also a wide variety of relationships that we've built up over time around the research related to social emotional well being. So here's the curriculum. We, we line it up now next to MDI measures. So on the left-hand side, you can see the personal social competences in our new educational curriculum. And our job has been to align the MDI directly with those personal social competences so that we really build the credibility of our work. And we also ensure that the government is using the kind of monitoring we do as part of their own monitoring and um, their own monitoring system and maintaining a focus on the topic. Um, so the importance of um, universal SEL or social emotional learning um, as a foundation and prevention has been a core part of what we do and we've been privileged in the last little while to be also directly connected with our Ministry of Education around building a mental health promotion strategy in schools. I'm particularly excited about this 
Um, we're hoping that a re the report that we produce for them will be released in the near future. And what it's actually recommending is a systemic or a system-wide educational strategy that builds at its foundation systems leadership and partnership toward um, a robust mental health promotion strategy, knowing that all sorts of other mental health literacy, literacy strategies and other more intensive services for children who really need them will be built um, through work with other ministries. So again, the use of data and research to really drive shifts in large scale policy at that ministry level. Um, I'll just hop through here um, because I think I'm out of time. So I want to just reflect on a couple of things before I finish or as I finish. Um, and the first is to say this work is complex. Um, we're 18 years in and we're still learning and we still don't necessarily have ourselves in a place where we want to be. When you look at our vulnerability rates, they're still moving up and we still have a lot of work to do. Um, a lot of the work that I'm doing um, is related to this idea that we still have a fragmented system. No matter how much work we've done, we still see fragmentation between the silos that we've created. We have a system with silos, and um, this is just a graphic representation of that, when what we're trying to encourage through um, the work that we do and the work that we're doing with individual ministries and organizations is this idea of a more coordinated and intentional service delivery system in the knowledge that the outcomes that we are measuring and holding holding sort of public and open and keep keeping people's attention on, they're actually the outcome of a system that was designed to achieve them. So this notion that if we really want to shift, shift EDI vulnerability rates or improve thriving on MDI, we really need to start thinking about the system. And I would say the same thing about the kind of check data that we're gathering as well. So my own, my own real personal slant on this at the moment is that I'm becoming more and more fascinated in the system isn't out there, it's within us. We are the people who are the system. The idea that actually the, uh, the success of any intervention, and in this case, I would say policy, policy change investment is actually um, dependent upon the condition of ourselves and the way in which we come to our work. Um, and so um, increasingly the use of systems thinking and systems awareness tools and my own journey around bringing compassion into the work, work that I do um, is an important part of where we're going next. So with that, I'm going to stop. I think I'm probably at time, Neil, but um, very happy for conversation and questions. And let me encourage uh, those who have been listening to uh, send in uh, your questions uh, either through the question uh, box, the Q&A at the bottom, or through the chat function. Let me, while we're uh, waiting to see if there are other questions, let me, let me just start off, to, but first to say that was a wonderful presentation, a real tour de force. And I was writing down as you were, uh, you know, I've got five pages of notes here that I've taken and uh, but I was writing down the various people I want to send the presentation to, including our Secretary of Health and Human Services for the state of California and others in the state, our state, that are trying to think about what a new children's data system might look like, as as well as others in our life course intervention research network. So one thing that struck me and that just stood out, and I want to ask about is the you know it's your trends in vulnerability showing that things are kids are getting more and more vulnerable in uh, in bc and uh, especially in the social emotional area um which is part of a you know it seems like a worldwide trend because we're seeing the rates of suicides go up and self-harm rates and i'm just wondering if you've linked any of your uh, uh, MDI, EDI data on social emotional development and it's going in the wrong direction to these other measures of suicides and self-harm and other things and or you know are these just secular trends that are going on or you know how have you all been explaining that? Yeah um, so there's a technical answer to that question and then there's sort of a more general answer. Um, we haven't technically linked data. So we haven't 
gone away and actually pulled in data sets that are sort of from the health system in terms of um, mental health, no. Um, what we have done um, in our reporting and particularly the mental health work that we've been doing in the education sec sector is really, um, really be able to align what our data show with the data that's coming from other places, if that makes sense. So what it does is, is, is in, in is really intensify the importance of what we're saying. We're providing something from the perspective of children and what the children are, t are saying to us um, uh, um, from EDI, uh, sorry, MDI. But if you look at a variety of other measures, they're all saying the same thing, that we're experiencing these large scale trends in um, social emotional well-being, mental health. So in terms of trying to explain that, I mean, I think, the 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 first thing to say that i the first thing that would always come out of my mouth is it's complex we can't look for a simplistic answer toward the kinds of trends that we're seeing and what's showing up um later in life um and in this province we have i think i think one of the worst opioid crises in north america so it's so i, I we can't there's a, we can't make a causal connection, but what we can point to is things that we are concerned about that the research tells us um, um, is important for us to be paying attention so, to. So some things that we would be interested in are, um, again, sort of understanding infant mental health. If we do not have a sector that understands infant mental health and we're not setting up children from the start to have strong social emotional skills, it's not surprising that we see trends down the line that are sh where we're seeing um, poorer mental health showing up. Um, we're intrigued and certainly, certainly trying to lean into increasingly the impact of technology on um, children's social emotional well-being. And the check actually is gathering, will be gathering a lot of data on that children's use of technology with parents and the kinds of technology that they're, the kinds of um, things that they're doing online or on their devices. Um, we're interested increasingly in sort of a social, um, a socioeconomic dynamic where families are increasingly stressed. And we know from MDI research and Kim's research about stress contagion in the classroom, if that's true in the classroom then. So I think that it's a complex story. And what we try to do is unfold that story while also really being able to keep a light shining on the importance of um, a collective approach and starting as early as we can um, and not only looking at some very pointed and small areas of uh, diversity, but more broadly speaking, children's experience in the spaces that they spend their time in. Great, great. That's, uh very helpful. I would think it would be interesting just to look at, you know, the trends in opioid addiction and, um, you know, which has both a, uh, you know, a whole variety of complex causes, but a lot of it has to do with despair and dysfunction in families and also the, the other trends in suicide and self-harming rates and sort of see if they're happening in the same places where you're seeing, you know, to do some geospatial mapping of those things just to understand if you have hotspots um, of, you know, kids who are not doing well, parents who seem to be addicted and others who are in their teen years harming themselves and well, there's some hotspot analysis would sort of help zero in on some of that, but that would be one thing I would be interested in thinking about. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, uh, yes, absolutely. I will also say if we come back to sort of the concept of proportionate universality, what we know from some of the op opioid data is that um, one of the larger groups that been, have been affected by it is actually young children using opioids at home for the first time, and that cuts across every single um, region of the, the province. It's not, there's no consistency to it. Um, so it's a slightly, it's, co it's complex, right? But I, I, I do want yeah. to hold on to the idea that, um, the idea that 
a, a positive early start and supporting families to raise children in ways that build their resilience. So ensuring that families are well supported to raise children right. in a positive way is probably the most critical large scale sort of statement to make. Right, right, yeah. right, absolutely. Yeah. And, I, and I also think what's very pow pow powerful is the Ravelstoke example and what you said you know, that I, I hope others listening to me also found critical is that oftentimes it's not adding these services and programs. It's sort of the community coming together and somehow changing, in a sense, the ecosystem or the entire way, changing the pattern, in a sense, which is what Revelstoke did and not just added a bunch of new services. So it's quite an example of that model. A couple other questions that have come in, um, um, and I, there are two that I think uh, maybe you can talk about. One is, what are your suggestions? What have you learned uh, about um, places sort of picking up this approach and trying it for themselves? So as you've traveled to Nottingham and Newcastle, I know that You've been a bit of an evangelist for some of this kind of thinking about kids. And what gets places started? There are a number of people in the US who are saying, this looks great, how do we get going here? Um, I obviously have some experience with trying to get it going here, but what has been your experience what, as, you know, to spread and scale what you're doing? What do you think are the most important things? you know to some yeah. other places to pick this up and well, not just go oh that's vancouver they can do it but we can't you know yeah well we started somewhere so it has to be it has to be possible right i'm not too sure this would have been the logical obvious place to to start but um i mean i i, I could get quite reflective about that i mean i think that um the the first the first is a true belief in the importance of doing this kind of work. I mean, Clyde Hertzman, our founder, um, was relentless about the fact that if you do not have high quality data that reflects on, broadly speaking, children's experience, you really don't have a base to work from. And he pretty well would talk to anyone about that, that he felt would, would listen. Um, the second thing is, he tried it out. I mean, he found the Vancouver School District and asked if they would do it with him. Um, and um, it, it literally went viral. I mean, I think after the first data collection in Vancouver, and he had the brilliant idea of mapping things, and it went into the Vancouver Sun, um, it just took off from there within three years, the EDI was across the province. So I think finding a place for him that was willing to pilot it with him and go deep and understand that it takes time and effort, right? You actually have to work together on it. I think the third thing that he probably would say, and, and for me is still important, is everyone is your partner. We, we spend time with teachers unions, we spend time with, any, any organization that has any skin in this game is an important partner to us in some form or another. Um, another, another thing worth saying here is, um, Clyde started this, and again, for me, it's critical. If there are two people in the room, they're the right two people in the room, and we go there and we spend time with them, talking to them about what we do. Um, and then going back to the concepts that I put in my presentation, you know, constantly grounding this in a message of this is because we care about children and families and because we know that if we do this right, our society will be healthier. So holding on to those big messages, I think, are also really, really important. So, um, I mean, I would say, yeah, we, I mean, we were talking about it in Nottingham, starting where it makes sense to you. You don't have to start with EDI. You could start with the MDI if you have a set of schools who are really interested in social emotional learning and are interested in children's voices. But thinking very intentionally about um, holding on to the vision of something bigger um, and really framing it for people and holding on to the consistent language about the power and importance of these kinds of data and this kind of system, I think is absolutely critical. And, and realizing that it's one relationship at a time. Um, it really is one relationship at a time. And th very, I mean, I should also say, I should also say you do need money. 
Um, we were, <laughs> that helps. I should, I should say, um, help was very fortunate and probably because Clyde was such an evangelist. Um, but he was very fortunate to get a very large gov a government grant from three ministries. So help continues to be funded by the Ministry of Health, the Ministry of Education and Children and Family Development. And to me, that's a really critical part of the story because I have a reason to go and sit with those ministries every quarter and talk to them about what, you know, what we're thinking about, what we're doing, what the data are saying. Um, and it also means that their ministries are invested in what we do. Yeah, that government leadership and, and uh, commitment is really important. It's been important for you there. It's been important here, California, because our first five commission in Orange County has been our partner on the EDI for the last 10 years. And their commitment to that has really allowed us to go back and now have a, a additional waves. And we're finding the same commitment from our first five commission here in, in Los Angeles. I know in Australia, that's been the case also. The, the other uh, set of questions that, that have come up are also about this issue of when you talked about silos and alignment of, of different sectors, can you can you talk a little bit more about your experience in breaking down silos or helping silos dissolve or bringing sectors together in a, in a common purpose and alignment? Yeah, um, I mean we can think about this at a number of different levels, and the local level is probably often the most the most easy to be able to to talk about it and actually to see shifts and changes quite quickly. Um, I mentioned in my presentation um, early years intersectoral tables and these and this, the tables in this province the, um, really grew up alongside help and um, have used consistently the data and research that we generate um, to help guide their work. Um, and they also um, received support for coordination. So someone who was the glue really that held that together. So this idea of creating a forum or a place where the expectation is that people from different parts of, the, the, of, of community life, from health to education to um, crime and the police or whatever whatever else is, seems to fit for the region you're in, bringing a group of people together who have a cons consistent and, and common care for children and families to me is the most important thing to do. Um, increasingly with my colleague Joanne Schroeder, we've been working on a model that we're calling Growing Compassionate Systems Leadership and so that's really working with um, the idea of it starts with us that we need to get better at coming into a room with our passion and our care for children and right. families. We need better skills of collaboration and connection. We've got lots of groups in this province that say they collaborate, but probably really more have coffee together than true collaboration. Um, and then the other is using systems thinking tools as a way of actually opening up the box of what, what are these systems and how do they touch the, uh, the lives of children and families and where are those places of gap or fragmentation or difficulty for children and families. So working in real time and real place with groups of people who all have a common commitment to children and families is the most important thing and building their capacity to do the collective work together is essential. What I will say is that work is a a darn sight harder at a ministry level. And I'm not too sure I have um, immediate examples other than that, um, well, a, a lot of our ministries now are doing more um, cross ministerial work through, well, mental health and addictions is a cross ministerial piece of work. Um, I'm grateful that we're funded by three ministries. If you can get different ministries into the room to act as, a, as an advisory or to connect in to that common sense of purpose and vision, I think you begin to be able to have conversations that set the stage for breaking down some of what creates those silos, which is you know the culture and the ways in which money flows and licensing is done and all those other good things but you have to start with the people in the room with a common sense of purpose. 
Right, right. Great. Well, I know I can keep talking to you for hours, uh, but we've reached the end of our time. And I want to thank you once again for uh, not only your presentation, but in your partnership, it was our discussions uh, a year and a half ago that led to this whole series that we put together. And you helped plan it with me and, and put it together. And I'm glad uh, we could um, not only put, put the whole series together, but present it in a way that I think uh, it's now archived and be available for others to, to look at. And uh, so again, thank you for all the help with this and for uh, for doing this and for all those listening today. Thanks for listening. Tell your uh, your friends about the uh, about the series and it's up on our it will be up on our Life Course Research Network website and uh, we'll make sure that it's available. Um, so again, thanks, uh, Pippa, and I hope to see you soon. Yes, absolutely. And I'm sure that there are things I've said that either went clear or you want more. So don't hesitate anyone to be in touch with me if I can fill in the gaps. All right. Thanks so much. Thank you, everyone.